And don't worry about standing. We're staying seated. Just enjoy the going to be a different history there. Oh, yeah. We're ready. Number 64, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
everyone. There I am. And welcome. Welcome to Third Advent. Welcome everyone back to your church home. Welcome home to St. Andrews. Welcome home to all of you who are, are connecting with us through Zoom as well. So today is Third Advent, but before we get into our worship, I want to thank all of those who were a part of last Tuesday night and making it happen. For those of you who loaned your nativity sets to us and those who came to be a part of the service for one another, to Jeannie and Don and Dorothy for all your help, Jeannie, everything. It was an amazing night and it was a quiet, soft night of, of carols and prayer and lighting candles for our hurts and our pains at this time of year. So thanks to everyone who was a part of that. Also, thanks to Louise and all her helpers for the Mrs. Claus gifts and coordinating that event too. So thank you, Louise, for, for taking on that as well. And to those of you who have left poinsettias for us to enjoy during Christmas time. And they last to Christmas, right? What do I know about plants? But they're here now, and hopefully they live through Christmas. They don't at my house, but they are lovely. So thanks to all who have offered lovely poinsettias for us. And just a reminder, next Sunday in the morning at 10 is 4th Advent. So today we light the 3rd Advent candle. Next Sunday morning we light the 4th Advent candle. And then at night at 7 o'clock we will have more of a traditional candlelight and carols and communion. And that'll be a, a service at 7 o'clock. And again, a, a Christmas service like we haven't been able to really have in a long time. And um, that night as well, we will be singing lots of carols and we will be lighting the Christ candle as seems fitting, right, for Christmas Eve. On December 31st, now we're halfway into our 12 days of Christmas and we're tired by then, right? So on December 31st, it's Pajama Sunday. You come to church in your pajamas or your house coats or your tracksuits, or whatever keeps you comfortable. And we have a singing service with some scripture, and you go back home to bed. And so that's, that's what you're able to do on December 31st. Enjoy time together, come super comfortable, and, um, and then we'll just have our service that way. And on January 7th, it'll be Epiphany. So of course you gotta save up energy for Epiphany, which is the end of our Christmas season in the church. That's about it. Today is Third Advent. Today is about the joy of faith, and it's about the mitten tree, and we will be bringing forward other items for the mitten tree during the singing of the mitten tree song, which apparently you guys don't know, but you will know very shortly. And uh, that'll happen just before our giving of a regular offering. So there's a whole lot happening at this time of year. Well, let's quiet our thoughts. And let's open our hearts this day to God beyond us, around us, among us, and with and within us. Let's open our hearts to each other here and those beyond here and those who we hold in our hearts with all sorts of love and care. And we hear these words from the scripture of 1 Thessalonians, Paul's oldest writing, the oldest writing in the New Testament. Rejoice always, he said, and pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen. Let's just hold for a moment while we, while we center ourselves into this time and place together. Michelle's going to offer us our acknowledgement this morning and the lighting of our pink candle for joy.
We acknowledge injustices inflicted on those who come from many ethnicities, faiths, and societies. Hate has no place in Jesus' teaching, nor should it live within us. We strive to open our hearts and minds and embrace differences. In so doing, we will be examples of the acceptance and love Jesus had for everyone. Today we kindle the Advent candle of joy. This flame marks the spark that dances with the Holy Spirit, the spark that fires and inspires our souls, the spark of creativity and wonder. With the flames of hope and peace, this flame sparks and speaks to the joy of faith. As we sing our introit this morning, I invite you to stay seated and let this introit be a prayer from our hearts. Advent, and Advent is the time when we open our hearts to our hope being in God and our hope being in the promises of God. We open ourselves to finding and knowing the peace of Christ deep within us, too. And then we live into the joy of faith as we sing of God's love. And so we will sing this day.
let us pray. God of hope, peace, and joy, as we come together this morning, we come to hear your word of peace, to sing the story of our faith, to pray with hope for the fullness of your presence to come. So we pray, may we be moved by your spirit and readied for the birth of the Christ child once again, only now into the mangers of our hearts. Amen. Advent, as we've talked about over these weeks, can be a really tricky time. It's a time for contemplation and for reflection on the meaning of God in our lives while we do what I like to call the Christmas hustle at the malls and the stores with ribbons of stress dripping from our parcels. Sometimes Advent is also a time in which we carry a heavy grief or a longing or a sorrow in our hearts. And in all this, all that happens at this time of year, we can actually forget that God is birthing new life into our world over and over again, into our hearts one by one. Without hope and peace, we can forget that joy of faith. We can forget the faith we have itself and that it's ours to hold. So let us continue to pray. God of joy, our days and our nights and our minds and our hearts, they're busy. They're as busy as, and as crowded as the malls and the parking lots. God of joy, we carry in our hearts more than the parcels in our arms. And we long to feel your presence. And we long to know the joy of faith that is woven with hope and with peace. So we pray, forgive us, and may we forgive each other for being distracted or for rushing towards Christmas, for not taking the time to remember that Advent is a waiting time. It's a journeying time, and it's a reflecting time with you, God. Advent is a waiting time as we await the birth of the Christ child once again. Amen. Let us be assured that the weeks of Advent are woven, imagine them woven with the threads of hope and of peace into the receiving blankets of faith that we lay down in the mangers of our hearts. With these threads of hope and peace, today we also weave into them the joy of our faith. And I'm going to ask, Eric, would you like to put the receiving blanket into the manger today. I meant to ask you earlier. Nayla has offered this one to us today. So you can put it into the manger as we imagine receiving blankets of faith in our hearts. Not sure we're on here. Are we on? We're on. Okay, good. So this is all about joy. Joy is such a wonderful thing. So let's uh, let's be joyous. Jump for joy. I can feel you near me, God, I can feel you near. Yes, I know you're with me, God, I feel you here. I can feel you near me, God, I can feel you near. Yes, I know you're with me, God, heaven is here. Oh, I'll jump for joy, I'm singing hallelujah. Jump for joy for you. I will jump for joy, I'm singing hallelujah. Jump for joy for you. Yes, I'll jump for joy, I'm singing hallelujah. Jump for joy for you. I will jump for joy, I'm singing hallelujah. Jump for joy for you. 
Well, I can feel you loving me. Yes, I know you care. God, I know you're loving me, always everywhere. I can feel you loving me. Yes, I know you care. God, I know you're loving me. I know you're there. Well, I'll jump for joy. I'm singing hallelujah. Jump for joy for you. I will jump for joy. I'm singing hallelujah. Jump for joy for you. I will jump for joy. I'm singing hallelujah. Jump for joy for you. I will jump for joy. I'm singing hallelujah. Jump for joy for you. Jump for joy for you. Jump for joy for you. Let's take a bit of time to do something a little different. Did you want to come and help me with this? God is good all the time. God is good. So, well, first of all, my kids were little, and I think you all will remember, we would write letters to Santa the old-fashioned way. And it would be on paper, and we'd put it in an envelope, and we'd send it to Santa Claus at the North Pole, H-O-H-O-H-O, -O -O, right? Who did that? There you go. They always went to Santa, and we would get letters back. But I wasn't sure if that was the same address, so I thought, what the heck, I did it, right? And I got back an email. God has advanced. Not God, Santa Claus. Ooh, that was interesting. So I came back to minister at standandrewsmarkham.com from Santa at Elfville at polar.com. See, I wouldn't have known that, right? And what I had asked was, was there anything you want me to tell the kids? And this is what I got back. I think an elf wrote it, but maybe it's signed by Santa. Maybe it was Santa after all. So I thought we would do this. So first thing the email said was, teach the children the meaning of Christmas, the meaning that a nowadays Christmas has forgotten. So he said, get a big bag. So I did. I got a pillowcase, sort of a bag, right? And it was, get it a big bag that might be like a sack and put in it a fir tree. Well, I couldn't put a fir tree in this. But what I did do was, oh, let's hope it stays together. Well, a plastic tree, there, except it's missing the top. Don't worry about that part. So. Then the email says, teach the children that the pure green color of the stately fir tree, pretend, remains all year round depicting the everlasting hope of humankind, and all the needles point heavenward, pretty much, making it a symbol of our thoughts turning to heaven and our thoughts turning to God. Now this was from Santa. Then pull out a brilliant star. So I got all these things in here because there was a bunch of instructions. So maybe you can put the star on. Oh, look, a piece of tree just fell. So teach the children that the star was the heavenly sign of promises long ago. The star was the sign of the fulfillment of God's promise to be with us always and to be with us closely with the Messiah. There we go. Then pull out a candle. It won't go on the tree, but we can put it beside the tree. So I'll give you the candle. And it says, teach the children that the candle symbolizes that Christ is the light of the world. And when we see this great light, we can be reminded that Jesus is the one. Love among us is how the darkness is pushed away. And Jesus is the light that pushes away the darkness. Then it says, reach into the bag and pull out a wreath. Got things attached. There's a little wreath. We can put that on the tree. And it says, place the wreath on the tree. Teach the children that the wreath symbolizes the real nature of love, that real love never ceases, and that love is a continuous round of affection. <clears throat> then reach in the bag and pull out an ornament of Santa himself. You see, that's why I think the elf wrote this, not Santa, because why would Santa say Santa himself? So anyway, there you go. That can go on the tree. 
Teach the children that Santa Claus symbolizes the generosity and the goodwill we feel during the time leading to Christmas, and that during Advent, that feeling can grow and grow as we wait for the birth of the Christ child into the mangers of our hearts. And that reminded me of the Grinch in the movie, but that's another story. So then it said, pull out a holly leaf. Now my girlfriend has a bush, it's this big, Karen, that I hike with, and it's real, it's holly, it's real. But we couldn't get together this week, so I had to go get this one. It's real plastic. <laughs> so we have, yep, oh, what's this? Oh, that's attached, that's neat. So the holly leaf, teach the children that the holly plant represents immortality. Maybe it could go around, I don't know. It represents also that giving for others completely can mean sacrificing part of who we are. And for Jesus, it even meant giving his life and time. Now reach into the bag, it said, and pull out a gift. Oh, cool. It's separate. We'll figure that one out in a minute. There's the gift. A big gift or a small wrapped parcel will do. We did small, small parcel. Teach the children that God so loved the world that God gave the essence of the love within to come to us in Jesus. And Jesus revealed God's love and God's kingdom and what a gift that was for humanity. So wherever you would like. What else is in here? Teach the children that the wise men bowed before the baby Jesus because they knew he was special and had a purpose from God. And the gifts they brought him were gold. I don't have any gold. And frankincense, no. And myrrh, no. Gold, though, would have been used to honor Jesus as a king. Kings have gold, right? Frankincense was used as an, a, a smell, a perfume for worship. And myrrh, myrrh is actually another type of person. It's a resin from a tree. It was often used for mourning, for sadness and grieving. So that ties into the three things about Jesus that, that happen later. But we should give to one another with the spirit of the wise man, it said. Now teach the children about the candy cane. It's small, but it is a candy cane. Hang it on the tree and tell them that it reminds us of the shepherds and the crook they carry to guide the sheep they care for, just like God's love guides us to. Then reach into the bag and pull out an angel. There you go. And teach the children that it was then angels that heralded in the glorious news of Jesus' birth. And then they sang, glory to God in the highest. And that's the song of creation, that there will be peace on earth. And that's the hope for the world. I'm not quite sure how you're going to put that on, or maybe with the gift, however you would like. Then from the bag, oh look, I found another candy cane. There you go. What else is in here? That's the bell. Reach into the bag and pull out a soft twinkling bell and teach the children that as the lost sheep are found by the sound of the bell, it should also ring for all people to come together in peace, just like we do here at St. Andrews. The bell symbolizes the guidance and caring and compassion we offer to each, and this way, or Jesus' way, is what we can spread throughout our corner of the world. Now, that's all that was in here, but it says further, Santa also said, I hope you can teach the children all these things so that the true meaning of Christmas is not lost. Help the children to remember that Santa is not the center of Christmas, but neither are the gifts. Christmas is about remembering, maybe even just learning, our whole Christian story and our history and why Christmas is so important, especially when we keep the birth of the Messiah front and center of it all. And finally, as you've laid the receiving blankets of faith woven with the threads of hope, peace, joy, and then later next week it will be love, as we lay them into the, mangers, the manger in our sanctuary, may they also be laid and woven into our waiting hearts Christmas Eve. Peace and Merry Christmas to all. It says Santa, but I think the elf sent it. What do you think? Mm -hmm. So we are going to have our prayer, and then we're going to be singing in a few minutes. Hark the, hark the what? 
Hark the Glad Song. And when we do that, I've got some extra balls in here to go on the tree, so maybe you can put them on while we sing. But first, let's pray, okay? Dear Jesus, help me to be honest. Help me to be kind. Help me to be loved. Amen. And hear us as we pray as Jesus taught the first disciples to pray. So we're going to sing, and I have these balls to go on the tree that maybe uh, you could put on. Maybe Michelle can help you because Michelle's going to go out with you for a bit. And you know what? We're coming all back together for the mitten tree song after you have your time with Michelle. That would be fun, but it might tip over on that tree there. One gospel reading today. Sometimes you hear it on third advent, sometimes you hear it on fourth advent. We're hearing it today. And it's from Luke chapter 1, verses 47 to 55. Now the passage is called the Magnificat, so called from the first word of the Latin translation. And it's actually based on Hannah's prayer for a child that's written of back in 1 Samuel. Remember 1 Samuel in the Old Testament? But now, here it is in the New Testament, and Mary has been visited by an angel. She has offered herself completely, wholly to God, saying, Here I am, Lord, and this Holy Spirit has come upon her. She's visited with Elizabeth, her relative, and Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, who are also expecting, and they're expecting the one that we spoke of last week, that was John the Baptist. But here, Mary is going to sing how God has blessed her, similarly to how Hannah sung, but Mary singing it and inferring also that it's for the generations to follow, how God has truly done great things. God continues to do great things and continues to rescue and save and deliver God's people, as promised long ago and forevermore, and in God's miraculous and mysterious ways too. So let's Hear this reading, and we'll just reading it for us. The 
Good morning, church. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Good morning. Tis the season for cheers and glad tidings. Luke 1, verse 47 to 55, the song of Mary. And my spirit rejoice in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowly state of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Indeed, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his child Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Thank you. May God's blessing be added to the hearing of all our words today, a word sung and spoken and offered and prayed. Moving from one place to another, we find we have to learn our way around. We have to adapt to new streets and new street signs and new libraries or new event centers and new lots of things, new stores, new restaurants. Same goes for moving from one church to another too. Moving to St. Andrews has been a lot of newness for me, totally new from where I come from and new from other churches. But coming here has also been an incredible blessing for me too. So I thank each and every one of you for your welcome and for your grace and how you've shown me around here in your own church and somewhat around the neighborhood in ways too. And you've introduced me to your corner of the world. So I thank you for that. We've had to learn about each other and learn about the traditions that I bring, that I've experienced, and those that you have and that you've experienced. Well, one such tradition over the last few weeks has caused us to really think and talk a lot. And today seemed like a good day to bring it up, to bring up about the Advent candles, because some of you have wondered. Your tradition has been to have purple candles for Advent as churches did for years and years and years, as many churches still do, and some churches will always do. Purple is for them. Purple in Advent was to make it like the purple in Lent, and it signified this as a penitential time. A penitential theme was woven through the weeks, so that Advent and Lent would be like similarly, and looking at ourselves would be the theme and confessing where we've fallen short. Penitential means to like feel humble or regretful pain or sorrow. Lent, as you know, is a time of preparation for Easter, and that includes this penitential theme and the spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting and almsgiving, which is giving to the poor. Lent is a time of preparation for baptism too, traditionally for literally a couple thousand years, but it's a time of emptying oneself to be ready to be made new. Dying with Christ, they say, so that you can be born again at Easter. Advent is also a preparing time, a preparing time to being made new. But it's also the preparing time for Christmas and for the birth of Christ. So it's a little different. In my last 20 years, the Advent candles have not been purple. They've been blue. They've been blue to go with the color of Advent according to the Christian calendar and to make Advent or mark Advent different from Lent. That's been my tradition. They've been blue to symbolize the hope and promise of God and salvation. The color has been sometimes a calm blue, just a really lovely calm blue, and other times a really rich blue, but blue to symbolize a royalty and the coming of a king and the night sky and the sea before creation and hope and even Mary. Now, churches in the Western world follow both colors. 
but often, as in my history, my experience, there has been an intentional and theological decision in the churches to discern a difference between Advent and Lent, and this difference has been sim symbolized through the different colors. But one thing has been consistent. Whether purple or blue, there is always a pink candle on third Advent. The third week of Advent is always pink. The pink candle comes long in tradition, back to the very early days of the church, it comes from the Latin. The third Sunday of Advent is called Godete Sunday. Its color is pink or rose, a real pretty rose color, as we have a lovely pink here, and it stands for the joy of faith and the gladness of the birth of the Christ to come. It's that joy that we feel and feel within us. So in order to blend our traditions, Jeannie and I wrapped your purple candles with blue ribbon from my tradition, and that's why they look like they do, as some of you have pointed out. We have wrapped purple in blue, but the pink remains the same, as this is the Sunday for joy, and we lit and lighted the pink candle. Today is also the Sunday that we have read of Mary, remembering that the angel came to Mary, announced to her to not fear, like who wouldn't be afraid if an angel showed up in front of you? Would you just go, oh? Anyhow, I think it's really important that the angel said, don't be afraid. But you know the angel also tells her what God has planned for her, planned for Mary. And Mary's response in Hebrew is, Hineni Adonai, is here I am, fully ready, your servant, willing to have you come to me, for me to serve you, and to do as you will. And then she sings the song you've just heard. I remember a number of years ago, there was an article in The Observer about the story of Mary through the centuries. And I was thinking of it last week and then started digging around till I found it. The young girl Luke, the young girl that Luke, sorry, describes as the mother of Jesus, was officially named Theotokos, which is bearer of God in 431 AD. That's quite a title. She grew as a universal symbol of maternal love, but also as a suffering and sacrificing love. As mothers and sisters and grandmothers, we know what it is to mother. It is mothering like that, right? And dads do it too, but what a mother does and what a father does can be different, but there is love. Sometimes Mary is seen or known as more, an, a more accessible link to God for some. Being human, a lowly, young, marginalized girl who was willing to say yes to God and, and shows us the way and invites us to say yes to God too. Did you know marigolds are named after Mary? And she's prayed for before sports events by some people. And the image in Mexico of Our Lady of Guadalupe is one of the most reproduced female likenesses of Mary ever. She draws millions to shrines, such as that in Fatima in Portugal, and the place called Nock in Ireland. Take a look online. These are beautiful places. She's inspired works of art and architecture. She's in poetry and liturgy and music, even beyond the church. I learned that Muslims also consider Mary holy, and apparently her name appears more often in the Quran than it does in our Bible. We know her best, perhaps, from the passage today, her song that we still call the Magnificat because of those first words in Latin and because it's our tradition that goes way back. But Mary's song is modeled on Hannah's song, and Hannah's song is her response to God's gift for her pregnancy back in 1 Samuel. Hannah prayed for a child, and she was barren, but God heard her prayer, and her child became the prophet Samuel, the one who heard God calling in the night. Like the song we sing, Here I am, God, I, I hear you calling in the night, heard you calling in the night. Before Hannah, though, was Miriam. We don't talk about Miriam much, do we? Miriam sang a song as well after God led the Israelites across the Sea of Reeds to a new life that was literally pregnant with possibilities and the knowledge of God. And their lives and their world were changed. Their world was really like turned upside down, 
and it was heard through her song and her song of praise and thanks. Before Mary, before Hannah, before Miriam was Sarah. Sarah was an older woman, beyond childbearing years. She becomes pregnant. God changed the world through her, too. It was another miracle. Mary's story today is different, though, in that she is young, not old. She's presumably fertile, not barren. She is faithful and trusting, not laughing, as Sarah did. And Mary is chosen to be the bearer of God's miracle that would change the world once again. But it's brought to her, not because of her praying for it to happen. And although since the Reformation, beginning in 1517, seeing Mary as an intercessor between us and God, it fell out of favor as the Reformers advocated, no, just pray straight to God. Many, many people still relate to Mary and still pray to this mother, this simple, human, young girl. Just think of the words from the, the song. Remember the Beatles? Let it be. Mother Mary comes to me. Many people think that Mary is the Virgin Mary, but Paul McCartney was actually singing about his mom. While Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire through the first millennium, Mary was typically portrayed as an imperial figure dressed in royal purple and gold. But then in the second millennium, from about the 12th century, well, she evolved into a kinder, gentler, more maternal figure, who we know better because we're following into the second, second millennium, and she was seen more often in blue. Some Christian traditions really focus on Mary. We don't tend to. But today we have the opportunity or the invitation on the third Sunday of Advent, or sometimes the fourth, but we have an opportunity to reconsider Mary and her story and our own stories, and how we might really relate to Mary. In our world today, there is war, there's fear of terrorists, there's climate change, excessive consumerism, materialism, obsessive gift giving. There are atrocities and homelessness and refugees and hunger, and there seems to be so much wrong in so many places. We are invited to reconsider and remember how God changes the world through very simple things, the young and the old, through Mary, that Jesus was born, and that was a young, that was a simple, that was a stable, and the world turned upside down through it all. Through us, the Christ, or the Spirit of God, might be born in a new way each and every year, and that is in us, in our own hearts then we might then work with and within God to turn the world around or turn it upside down a little more, one person or one corner at a time, but turn the world into the hope and the faith that we hold. Reading the works of scholars and atheists, we can be drawn into wanting to dispel our faith stories as myths or looking for proof or challenging any validity to the bright light stories of God against the dark evil we see in the world. But it really is in seeing this grace, in the absurdity of the story, really, that we actually do know hope when everything looks hopeless. And we can find rest and peace in our hearts when we trust and know there is God in whom we can have hope. And isn't that really the joy of faith that we also carry? And that is it not what allows us to then open our hearts to give and receive love with hope and peace and joy, and is that not the flow of grace to and through us all? And is that not Mary? Remember those words, Mary full of grace? For those of you who get The Broad View, which is the new Observer magazine, The Broad View of December, right now, 2023, has an article in it, once again, about Mary. It says that history has painted the mother of Jesus as meek and mild and of grace, yes, and calm and faithful and trusting. But some experts are starting to look at her with new eyes out of our time in the world. And perhaps she was almost more like a, a prophet in her own right. Perhaps that meek and mild young girl image kind of downplays another whole role that she played that mothers can appreciate. 
perhaps through history, she became more a symbol than an actual person, a girl, a woman, a mom, and a teacher. As a mother, perhaps she was the one who held the subversive and anti-imperialist views and whose role was in teaching and shaping her son's ministry that was maybe more powerful and influential than we normally think about. Because mothers are very influential, aren't we, ladies? And grandmothers, and stepmothers, and aunts, and godmothers, and sisters. There's something about us, right? And I think the men would agree. We're influential in different ways, and we have the power to change the world through the way we teach our kids. It's actually in Luke's Gospel that we learn more about Mary and a bit in John too. But all together, there's not much said about Mary. But there is a scholar, her name is Dr. Amy Jill Levine, and I had the absolute privilege of having breakfast with her a number of years ago. She's a scholar of Second Temple Judaism and of New Testament theology and New Testament scholarship, and yet she is Jewish. But she says that then and now, to this day, women have been and are the primary teachers of little children. And teaching not only about the household and how the things happen day to day, but women teach and have always taught about our faith. And you know, many of you know that I've been working on research, and you know what? My research is showing this, proving this over and over too. In our churches, it is there over the years, just Think about how many women and mothers and grandmothers and aunts and godmothers and each of you, sisters, who have been those who have taught Sunday school and taught the faith in your own homes, taught your family to have a Christian home, and taught how to live out our faith as demonstrated through everything the UCW does, everything the women of the church do to support the church and to support others beyond, like even the Mrs. Claus things, right? All those examples. Men and dads and grandpas, oh, they have a definite role. But it's a different role. And we can't deny women have a role, and we have had, and therefore even then let's think of Mary and the possible role she had in teaching her Jewish faith and traditions to her child, to her son, Jesus. So who is Mary then, really? Well, she's the one who accepts the angel's message. She's the one who is filled with the spirit of God. She is filled with the spirit of love and of faith. Mary's the one who lives the pregnancy of carrying a special child. She's the one who knew the love of God in her that would be born through her. And she would teach her son of what she knew of her God and his God too. And isn't that more the invitation to each of us at Christmas, this Christmas and every Christmas. You're invited, each of you, all of you, and me too, to allow the story of Mary. It's an incarnational story. But allow it to happen in you, in me, in all of us. Like if we close our eyes, can we feel the rhythm of our heart and the rhythm of our breathing? And can we be sensitive to the presence of God within us? And all that that can mean to you in your life, and maybe, maybe make your own song, maybe make our own Magnificat song of God's work in us. What if we were to write a song, each of us, and, and write it down, and, and write down what your faith is to you, what you believe, why you believe what you do, where it has been with you in the past, where it leads you now, how your faith has sustained you, and how God touches your heart. In doing so, what if then we went and sang our own songs to God in prayer, or maybe through Mary? But isn't that the invitation? Go sing your song through your living. Go sing your song of how your faithful living and generous loving does have the power, and you've seen it, turn the world around, even one corner, one person at a time. So let's go sing out and sing out our soul's songs of Advent joy. May the real power of Christmas be born and lived in each of us as we have learned, as it's been taught to us, and as we have taught it beyond us too. 
Amen. Let us pray. Holy God of joy, we pray with thanksgiving in our hearts and on our minds for this waiting time of Advent, a time to, to learn about our, our, the roots of our history, the roots of our faith story, the people, the John, the Baptist, the Mary, the Joseph, those who came before us and with us prepare this time for the Christ child to be born into the mangers of our hearts this time, God. And so we do pray that your spirit will move in us as you moved in Elizabeth and Mary and the shepherds and the wise men. God of joy, when we can know hope and peace in our hearts, then no matter what life throws at us, we can still know the joy of faith and believe and know that we are never alone and that you continue to create and to care for each of us and all of us. God, that you're still calling all of creation into being with and within you. Oh God, may we be moved by your spirit, promised and realized through the Christ. Holy One, preparing our hearts for love to be born is to open ourselves to the needs of the world, to hear the prayers of the world, and to offer ourselves with joy to serve the world. Through this journey of Advent, we prepare our homes, we prepare our hearts, and we prepare our church home for Christmas. While we hear of so many who are in need of the basic things of life, in need of peace and wholeness and safety and hope. So we bring our gifts each week, but especially this week. And God, we pray that you will hear our prayers that we gather together through this day, and that you will guide us, we will guide each other into action where and when we are able, or when we might be stretched to give even more. God, we pray, and we pray that we can be assured that you hear our prayers as we offer them to you and each other, and that by your love and the power of your Holy Spirit, we do trust, like Mary trusted, that you move in this world, in us, around us, among us, and in so doing, we answer prayers together. Holy One, hear us now as we offer you our most personal prayers that come from the depths of our hearts and that we offer in the silence. Holy God of joy, assured of your presence with us always and that we are never alone, we offer all these words in prayer. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, we have a tree. We haven't had a mitten tree in a few years. We have lots of items around, but I believe there's some other items still out there. And I have some here, and if uh, Derek's coming back, we'll give him some more to add to the tree. Well, we're going to sing about the mitten tree. You know the song, O Christmas Tree, right? So I'm going to invite you to stand and sing as you're able. We'll sing, O Mitten Tree. If you have items to put on the tree still or put at the bottom of the tree for hats and mitts and scarves or stuff for the food bank, just come on forward. Come on forward as we sing and, and let your gifts stand. But let us sing loud and clear and full. Let's go. Oh. 
that new? Have a seat. George is going to offer us their invitation to offering. And thanks to everyone for all your gifts. An invitation of offering. With joy in our hearts, we have and continue to offer our gifts of hats, mitts, scarves, and food throughout Advent. In this time together, let us also prayfully commit our regular offerings that through these gifts, the hope, peace, and joy we know by faith might be shared with others through the life and the work of our St. Andrew's Church family. Thank you. Happy giving. <laughs> That's nice. And as has been our practice, we give in many ways, not just here, but we also give through par, we give through, through check, we give through leaving on the plates at the back. We do a lot of things. Let us pray a dedication of all our offerings. Holy God of Advent and of new beginnings and of new life, with the offerings we've prayerfully committed, with those that will be on our plates today, with those we offer through par, with all the things that we have placed around this tree and food for the food bank and, and all the ways we give. And even the work of our hands through the week, God, we present ourselves as Mary presented herself. Holy One, may all that we give in faith become the seeds of hope for new life in those who need. May all that we give in love reflect your love and the light of the Christ. May the grace we know be the grace and the hope and the peace and the joy of our faith that flow through us by your Spirit through these expectant and patient and calm waiting weeks of Advent. Amen. As we sing this next song, think of Mary's song and think of her singing this with you.
place this church home that is yours. May your hope be in God. May you pass it on. May the path to your heart be made straight and clear and you might know God's peace along the way. May your life be with, with God be joyful, the joy of faith living and dancing within you. May you live every moment in the warmth of God's love. And may that love turn the world around because of you. Amen. the love of God surround you, that peace of Christ dwell really deep inside you, and that joy and compassion of the Holy Spirit, let it flow to and through you this day and always. Amen. everyone and we'll wait everyone out there with lots of joy and music on the organ and everything. Yeah. I'm fall apart if I pick it up. <laughs>